and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about non-traditional towns and nefarious noises. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Katrina Smith and Connor Wrights are voice talents Olivia Steele and Jeff Sturdivant. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our Theater of the Minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale of the evening is written by Katrina Smith and is performed by Olivia Steele. The town of Eben isn't big or extraordinary enough to be listed on any map or atlas. It's just a blip on the world, hiding and blending with the towns around it. But it's often said that evil likes to hide in plain sight. And without further ado, I present to you Bride of the Embalmer. Well, the first thing you need to know about the Bride of the Embalmer is that they always made a big deal out of funerals in Eben. I don't mean the way they do around here. I don't mean covered dishes and weeping, sitting with the dead, any of those sorts of traditions. These graves here would never meet Eben Code. Eben funerals are a little closer to a second line procession or a uh, Dia de los Muertos celebration, but that only gets you halfway to the truth. For one thing, the people of Eben have no real sadness or fear of death. You can hear it in the way they talk about the afterlife, devoted and earnest, like lovers waiting for the right moment to meet in the sunlight. Not that the sun burns the mists off Eben very often. Eben is in some thick, old-growth forest, but it's as if the entire town averts itself from the rhythms of daylight. It is somehow always twilight, and lights are kept on in every window, in every house, strung between every building. Red and white lanterns rock in every gnarled old tree. All the street lamps flicker one by one as the funeral march passes, singing along the bank of the resentful little river that trickles through town. Fish are one of Eben's only exports, and the ones that come from the river are strange as you'd expect. Little purple terrors with long teeth that curve light like funhouse glass. They're sweet though, succulent and dense, with pale flesh that glows like moonlight. 
and no ebon funeral worth any salt at all would be caught without them. No, ebon funerals are more like weddings. There's cake, dancing, shouting and laughing, sometimes confetti. Their doves are delicately roasted and stuffed full of spider figs, drizzled with a rich honey sauce. People in Evan don't have much, and wouldn't think of setting free something you can eat on, metaphor or no. Everyone wears their best and thinks jealously of the day they'll get to be the one sitting in the processional throne, walked to the altar, given away to the earth by their widows and children, trading the mean shackles of existence for whatever comes after the final dark. Most towns have a mayor to help the townsfolk through times of trouble and joy, but in Eben, no one matters more than the embalmer. A round, smiling man with bright black eyes and a thick, bristly mustache. He prepares all of Eben's dead for the journey to come, plumping cheeks and coloring lips, hiding imperfections and stitching up accidents. It's often said that the people of Eben look better spent than they ever did in the full bloom of life, and the embalmer has a way of catching everyone's finest attributes on the end of his brush, or hook, or knife. All Eben funerals are presided over by the embalmer and his art, and all are celebrations of the life that waits after death. The other thing they have in common is that they are all, without exception, burials. So imagine the reaction when the embalmer's bride passed, his most singular and truest love, and at the public reading of the documents on her willing day, it was revealed that she wanted her body to be burned instead to ash. Wait, go back. I've skipped too far ahead. Let me lean here on the shovel for a moment and think. This is something that happens when you spend too much time in Eben, moments spooling out of order, time as stretched and folded on itself as the sweet taffy they make from beetle paste. The embalmer had got himself a wife in the traditional way, through love and courtship, long before he was the embalmer, and he treasured her. Quick-witted and clever, she helped him pass every exam, learn every trick of post-mortem surgery, and they moved together to Eben not long after that. She had a tongue sharp as a lash, and we all felt it sting on occasion. You could hear them screaming at each other sometimes all the way down here in town, and woe betide those who got in her way at the butcher. But the embalmer liked an excessive spirit, and their love sparked just as intensely, burned just as hot. Some say they can see the mark of her on every face he's done. The red lips, the delicate rose blush he puts on every cheek, the mark of the man's tender regard for his beloved. She took to the mean, gloomy little town, walking around the streets like imported sunlight, brushing grave moss off the oldest headstones, reminding everyone that what came next was surely better. And coming from one like her, well, there was no question of belief, just Faith. Soon, that's what everyone called her, Faith. And they loved her nearly as much as the embalmer himself did. Certainly, they loved her more than they loved the embalmer. So it was with immense, bittersweet exultation that the embalmer walked from their cottage next to the graveyard on the edge of town one morning and announced that his wife had met death in the night. People weren't sad, exactly. I told you no one is sad about death in Eben. But there was some disappointment at her length of stay on Earth as they went about planning the funeral of a lifetime. The embalmer worked feverishly on his dead wife and when the time came for the procession, the wife paraded through town on the throne in the traditional way. It was widely agreed that he had never done better. The lips so red, the cheeks so pink, those lifeless eyes are still glittering with memory. That hair is a cascade of satin. When the wife slipped from her chair once, 
the scarlet silk of her wedding turned funeral dress tearing just enough that we thought we could see where a fine silken stitch had pulled flesh back together over the stick of a knife to the heart. We thought nothing of it. Post-mortem embellishments were not uncommon after all, and the embalmer was allowed affectations. No one could question the depth of his love for his dearest wife. The funeral came and went, the wife interred in the cemetery's finest plot. Never had more flowers been thrown at the feet of the embalmer. Never had townsfolk danced so joyously, screamed so loudly, ate so many stuffed doves as they did for the wife. The town gossiped about who would take over her duties. Who would bake the funeral cake and visit the sick and dying? Who could tend the funeral doves and pick the spider figs? There was no question of the embalmer marrying again. Who could hope to follow true love? Except only two months after the embalmer's wife found her way to death's door and crossed eternity's threshold, the embalmer walked into the tavern on a cold, rattling kind of November night, and on his arm was another girl in a scarlet dress, thinner and paler than the last. The journey, the embalmer said, hadn't been easy for his new young wife, a sister to the one he'd lost. And if it weren't for the dark circles under eyes that were blue instead of green, blonde hair so fine and fair as to be all but white where the first sister had been raven and wild, we might have thought it the dead walking, so alike they were. She looked around the tavern with something like interest, but her eyes were filled with a wary sort of distance we had no way to measure. We put it down to the miles she traveled, over bad roads in bad weather, and welcomed her coldness as best we knew. <laughs> you see how slippery it can be to tell a story of Eben like a live eel twisting against the fire. <sighs> now I've gone and made myself one of them in the telling. Part of we. And I suppose I was. The embalmer's new wife settled into a comfortable pattern in Eben, even if she did take to wandering the forest late at night when most good things were meant to be abed, searching for something she never did find. She had an odd habit of turning up in strange houses in the morning. We soon got used to her drifting here and there throughout the cold winter, taking advantage of any open door, any available fireside. She had a way of pressing unexpectedly close to a person, her silent mouth as urgent in the moment as her eyes were far away in seeking. We never discussed this with each other. We missed the first wife, her tender regard, her effortless competence and easy smile, her harpy screech of disapproval, her ability to stay put in her own house with her own husband. We were polite enough to not say as much to her sister, who settled into the duties of an embalmer's wife as poorly as she'd settled into being a bride. At least she had no outspoken opinions on our moral character. It was her only, finest asset. The new wife was as soft-spoken and breathy as the first wife had been shrill, and took up as little space as her sister had taken up everything. She was so quiet that when we asked her name that first night in the tavern, no one could hear it fade out into the well-lit room, and we made her repeat it over and over, the name slithering clear out of our heads every time. After that, we gave up on hearing her speak and just called her Patience. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by June's Journey. The Roaring Twenties was a special time, friends. A whole lot happened in the hundred years since, but I tell you, it all went by in the blink of an eye. It seems like yesterday I was competing in that dance marathon at the Stork Club on West 58th. Me and my top tomato cutting the rug. 
I and my fanciest glad rags and junes spiffed out to the max. She was a real Sheba, a pair of stems that went all the way up to her eyebrows, and a chassis that'd put your old breezer to shame. I'm talking Major League Hotsy Totsy, the bee's knees. She collapsed seven hours into the Charleston competition. Dehydration. The paramedics said one too many giggle waters. They couldn't bring her back. And just like that, my best gal went from the cat's pajamas to the wooden kimono. It was a very difficult time for me. So you can imagine how I felt a whole century later when I downloaded this amazing mobile game called June's Journey and found myself back in the 20s of my youth with my old flame staring me right in the face. Her spitting image, June Parker, amateur detective. You guys ever played June's Journey? Here's the rundown. It's a murder mystery slash hidden object game set back in the roaring 20s, complete with all the charm and aesthetic I remember so well. You and I play as June Parker, detective extraordinaire, investigating a dark family secret. From there, you'll collect clues and solve mysteries in beautiful intricate scenes all around the world. With each level, you'll collect coins and rewards, earn upgrades, and unlock new scenes to explore. It's got all the danger, romance, and mystery of an action-adventure game, but in a relaxed, more cerebral setting that'll test your recall and observational skills. Add to that a great storyline that'll keep you interested. My favorite times to play June's Journey are in the morning for a little warm-up and at night to wind down and relax. I like to use the memoir feature in the morning and help June piece together our old memories. Very sentimental for me. Most nights, though, I get together with the boys in my detective club and we do our thing. There's always an experience waiting for you in the June's Journey universe. I challenge you to play to at least Chapter 2 and see if you don't connect with your inner Sherlock just like I did. You know you will. There's a reason everyone loves a good mystery. Because there's a detective in all of us. So find your inner detective. Download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Patience came and went by the time the new leaves began to unfurl, taken overnight by a sudden fever. Once again, Eben held a grand funeral, if not quite as grand as the first, funeral expenses are what they are, but there were plenty of small fish, if not so many doves. Once again, the embalmer drew her face fine and beautiful as ever, and once again he consigned a wife to the grave wearing a scarlet dress. This time, silk and thread stitched the red mouth up tight. This was, he said, to keep the fever trapped inside. The embalmer spent all of that wet spring and the next sullen summer without a wife. From town, we could see him moving around in the graveyard, lights going on and off in the cottage and his tiny workroom at all hours, losing himself in the work. There was plenty of it. The summer was wet and cold, and a few of our finest residents were lucky enough to ride by accident or illness to the grave. We had the usual funerals, danced the usual dances, wondered when it would be our turn to carry on past this miserable life. Harvest came in thick enough for a lean, careful winter, and this was around the same time the newest bride arrived. The embalmer came into the tavern filled with a transcendent joy, his signature scent of lilies and decay mixed with the sharp tang of embalming fluid, the subtle and unmistakable perfume of most joyous celebration. His new bride had finally come, but she was shy and reclusive, and he hoped in time she would feel comfortable enough to meet Eben properly. Until then, would we give them the time to settle in together? We would. We watched the lights go on and off in the small cottage from afar, the embalmer and his bride dancing around each other, 
two shadows rotating like heavenly bodies pulled inexorably towards each other, yet never connecting. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry for the dirt flying in your face. You don't mind, do you? It's just that the grave is so tight, the pool of lantern light so thin against this blackest of new moons. It's hard for me to see where it ends and you begin. I suppose there's no better place to listen than from all the way down here at the bottom, eh? But you wanted the story, didn't you? And all desire comes with consequence. The newest bride's funeral was announced before we ever saw her come out of the shadows and into the light. The announcement was found nailed to the front of the town hall in the first flush of the morning, and with it the bride's instructions to be burned to ash. What hue! What outcry! Stranger or no, surely the embalmer had taught her the sanctity of our ways, the privilege of transition, and a decaying corpse, the joy of the throne and the procession. Would she deny us her death as well as her life? The cottage remained shuttered tight against the midday, and no amount of hammering on the door could raise the embalmer. Reluctantly, we did as her willing requested. Dry snags and twisted old trees were pulled into the center of town, mixed with bouquets of rosemary and angelica root and asphodel, the small peels of oranges and withered apples, pine pitch and tar. Her throne-shaped pyre was set in the town square next to the altar. Doves were caught and stuffed, pumpkins steamed and filled with crushed violets and sage, eels roasted, instruments tuned, buntings draped. We prepared that night for a different funeral than any we'd known, taking what comfort we could from the usual trappings of celebration. Just as the gray sky darkened to purple and the sun began to slink past the boundary of the known world, the door to the embalmer's cottage flung open, and emerging from it, stately and graceful as ever in life, if it turned out a bit less cohesive, came the embalmer's bride. Behind her in the mud dragged the tattered trail of a scarlet gown, and wrapped into it, struggling madly, the embalmer himself. Thus did Faith Patience, the bride of the embalmer, come to meet the town. She stopped in front of her pyre, the scent of rank decay and sweet lilies settling around us all like a final lingering kiss. We stood captive and spellbound before her. From one blue eye, Patience gazed vacantly over the silent town, and from one green eye, Faith raked us all with wordless fury. We could see clearly the landscape of the embalmer's work. Clean, delicate stitchwork crossed the lovely face like boundary rivers in a map marking the outer limits of a land beyond our understanding. What he had done was nothing short of astonishing, a true monument to his intelligence, his will, his endless, unstoppable love for faith, that not even the sacrosanct testament of the other side should keep him from his love. He had grafted two wives into one. You are right to scream. It is truly amazing, sirs, what relentless determination and artistry can do to an immobilized body, to two bodies when it comes to that. But back to our story, you came all this way for it and must see it to the end. Surely you have an inkling where we're headed. Her red lips parted, those bloated white cheeks blooming with the peach of the embalmer's brush rose as she smiled. From deep inside the black maw of her decaying mouth, we could see the line of stitches bisecting one tongue and connecting another. Faith Patience spoke, using patient softness, a series of words that are forever burned into memory. I'm very sorry, Patience said. My husband has done terrible things, and I am the least terrible of them. 
I'm so sorry to be such an inconvenience. From behind her came the sound of the embalmer choking on the gag of red silk stuffed into his mouth, trussed as he was, like a funeral dove ready for the roasting. We quivered with rage to see him debased so. She stopped, her swollen throat convulsing suddenly, and closed her eyes. Her hands flexed creaking fists at her sides. Faith blazed from the one green eye, trying desperately to force Patience's meek tongue into iron. A sly and honest murderer. In a moment of anger, he struck Faith through our heart. In a moment of cruelty, he poisoned sweet Patience for our parts. The problem, he believed, was Faith's tongue, not his dagger hand, not his twisted desire. The problem was patient softness, not his depravity. And the worst of this is that he has abandoned you all, townsfolk of Eben. Despite every missive you hold most holy, he has not let us cross to the other side. We, Faith Patience, the Embalmer's Bride, will cross tonight. And we will take our husband so that he might answer for his crimes. We watched, paralyzed, as draped in determined glory and with a sweep of her tattered gown, Faith Patience sat on the pyre we had constructed for her, the embalmer screaming and writhing against his bonds at her feet, and with a small, self-satisfied smile set herself alight. What happened next is a matter of public record, of course. Officially, the fire broke free of the confines of the pyre and spread first to the bunting, then to the dance floor, from the dance floor to the butcher shop filled with tallow and fat, and soon the entire town was aflame, fires burning off Eben's deepest shadows with more illumination than the town had ever known. As for the embalmer, that poor man, driven to deny his life's work, his moral compass, his righteous, tender shepherding of souls to the shores of eternity, in order to right the wrong he'd done in the heat of rage so red and intense he had no memory of them, that tortured soul who wanted only to bring his dead wife back, that his love might erase all past transgressions, that he and she might start anew and anew and anew? Some say he burned up in the fires that reduced all of Eben to ash, the bride's final gift to the town she loved. Others say he broke free and ran shrieking through the town with the bride chasing after, her flaming arms open in a final embrace, that this is how the town really burned. Those who believe this look for him here and there still, near cold stone and grave dirt at midnight. But as you have come to understand, sirs, they never return. The truth is, no one still living knows what happened to me. I hope you enjoyed Bride of the Embalmer, as written by Katrina Smith and voiced by Olivia Steele. Katrina Smith writes as many weird things in a year as she can. She lives in Bend, Oregon, beneath the creaking of ponderosa pines, surrounded by animals, green plants, and a suspiciously helpful poltergeist. You can find her recent work in The Future Fire, Daily Science Fiction, and Metamorphosis magazine. To see more of her work, visit her online at www.katrinasmithwrites.com. You can hear more of Olivia Steele right here on our very own podcast network and YouTube episodes, as well as on her own YouTube channel called Scarily Olivia. Our second tale of the evening is written by Connor Wrights, and is performed by Jeff Sturdivant. P. 
people resort to all sorts of methods when facing the terrors of insomnia. And there are certainly no shortage of those on the World Wide Web. Tonight, we meet a man who read about something called Black Noise, with disastrous results. Now, without further ado, I present to you 10 hours of Black Noise to bring you peace. Not being able to fall asleep sucks. For several months, I was dealing with this on a nightly basis. I'd go to school every morning on either a few hours of sleep or none. My grades were rapidly falling. My social life was non-existent. Life was like walking through a thick fog. Half the time, I wasn't sure where I was or what the hell was going on. I tried everything I could think of. Five milligrams of melatonin turned to ten, and ten turned to twenty. I started going for a run an hour before bed, even when my legs felt like they were moving in a dream. I tried not using electronics past seven o'clock. I didn't eat past eight o'clock. No luck. No matter how groggy, confused, and tired I felt, sleep eluded me when I laid down at night, like a song I couldn't quite remember. When I could fall asleep, the nightmares would wake me up and leave me shaking well through the rest of the night. My dad had taken to drinking to numb the pain, so he wasn't any help. It felt like he was passed out more often than not. I couldn't blame him. I probably would have done the same thing if I had access to alcohol. He would have killed me if I tried to take any of his. One Wednesday, around 1 a.m., when I was closing in on 48 hours of no sleep, I was scrolling through Twitter when one of those promoted tweets caught my eye. Are you having trouble falling asleep at night? Look no further. Your sleeping friend is here to help. Jeez, I thought. Google is spying on me. But a video was attached, and my curiosity was piqued, so I plugged in my headphones and hit play. The video showed an empty beach. In the background, calm blue waves ran up the shore. There were several moments of silence, and then a man began to speak in a low, slow whisper. The sound switched from my right ear to my left at each word. The syllables reverberated over each other. I'm your sleeping friend, and I'm here to help you get to sleep. On my channel, you'll find all kinds of videos dedicated to relaxing your mind. I have nature sounds, ASMR, white noise, and a plethora of other options. Find what you need, and never spend another night tossing and turning. I thought the whole ASMR whisper talking thing he was doing was creepy, but I was desperate so I clicked the link to his YouTube channel and started to sort through the videos. There were dozens to choose from, but I started on eight hours of nature sounds to pull you down. There were faint sounds of running water, birds chirping, and leaves rustling in the wind. It made me feel like I was in a different world. I didn't have to worry about school, my dad, or that night. The birds were my friends, and the water and the leaves were a gentle song lulling me to sleep. After a few minutes, I turned on my side and closed my eyes. But in the darkness, the sounds seemed to shift and change. The running water was a growling predator. The birds were a horde of crows waiting to make a meal of me. And the wind and the leaves were a menacing whisper in the distance. Before long, I was sweating and gripping my sheets with white-knuckled hands. I opened my eyes and turned off the video. I took a deep breath. Come on, man, just go to sleep. But I couldn't. Twenty minutes of lying down with my eyes closed did nothing. I needed something to drown out the silence. Ten hours of white noise to help you drift away. I could see why they called it white noise. It reminded me of TV static. Yet this sound seemed to take up more room in my head, like there was some sort of smoke attached. It was slowly flowing through my ears and into every crevice of my brain. For a moment, there was nothing except the sound. 
I relaxed a little and closed my eyes. But the instant I did, for just a fleeting second, I saw white inside of darkness, like I was inside of an empty Word document. And then, just for a split second, there was a whisper, soft and calling to me. I was sure of it, but I wasn't able to make out the words. With a sharp gasp, I opened my eyes. My heartbeat hammered in my chest. I sat still as if the slightest movement would set something off. I couldn't shake the feeling that the sound, the smoke, was an invading army, and that the whisper was a warning. I ripped the headphones from my ears and turned off the video. The dark does funny things to your mind, I told myself, especially when you haven't slept in two days. I checked the time on my phone. 2 a.m. I closed my eyes once more. If I go to sleep now, I can still sleep for four hours. In the dark, eerie silence, the memories came flooding back. The screams. My mom was lying in a puddle of her blood. Her eyes were open, but void of life. The wind whispered through the branches outside and I remembered how slowly the front door had creaked open, how I'd assumed it was my dad. I'd just woken up, and the fog of sleep temporarily left the fact that he was away on business shrouded. I didn't want to get in trouble for being awake, so I stayed in my room. No more of that, I thought, coming back to reality. I wanted to get up from bed and flip on the light, but it seemed so far away. I'd have to pass the void of uncertainty that was the shadows under my bed. I couldn't help but feel there was something under there waiting for me, that there was some sort of sound, but one that I couldn't hear. I couldn't get up. I grabbed my phone once more. I was already on the channel, figured I'd try another video. One of them had to work for me. After all, the thoughts hadn't come back until I stopped, right? Ten hours of black noise to bring you peace. This video had no apparent sound but white letters over a black background. It read simply, Black Noise. The text faded away and the video transitioned through slides like a PowerPoint. What is black noise? There is no noise. Silence. But I think you'll enjoy the silence. The darkness. Maybe you'll find peace. If you give it a chance. I felt my stomach rise in my throat. My breaths came out rapid, short, and sharp. Ten hours of black noise starting in. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. I closed my eyes unsure if it was voluntary or not, and saw myself from the eyes of an observer, a different me floating in the space of infinite darkness. My eyes were closed, and a smile of pure bliss was on my face. My breaths were slow, rhythmic, and relaxed. I was asleep. This version of me was sinking into the darkness slowly, so slowly that it took me several moments to notice. I smiled. I was happy for him, and my breaths began to match his. My consciousness began to fade as sleep pulled me in. Suddenly, I was falling so fast that I could feel the wind pulling around me. My feet landed on a cool, white-tiled floor. A kitchen. I looked around at the wooden cabinetry, mahogany dinner table, and light blue walls. It wasn't just a kitchen. It was my kitchen. It was a lucid dream, but though I'd never experienced anything like it, the familiar environment made me feel comfortable. And then there was that whisper again, coming from the other side of the wall, the living room. This time it was a little louder, loud enough that I could make out the words. Come, Come with, with me, me, it said in that low voice the syllables echoing over each other. Your, Your sleeping, sleeping friend. friend. 
I walked into the living room and was finally met with the source of that mysterious whisper. He would have been an average looking man, five foot ten or eleven, average frame, but the skin on his face was deathly pale, almost translucent. The closer I got to him, the colder I felt. He wore a tuxedo, and his right arm carried the hook of a beautiful dream catcher. The web in the middle was yellow and made to resemble four flowers leaning against each other. At the bottom, four black crow feathers hung vertically. They swung back and forth as he turned and began walking towards my dad's bedroom. Come, he said, and I did. I followed him through the living room and into the bedroom. The TV was on and playing Criminal Minds, my mom's favorite show. The one that had been playing the night she was murdered. My dad never watched that show. It freaked him out. But this isn't my dad's room, I thought. This is my mom and dad's room. My parents' room. Back before it became just my dad's room. I screamed. No! A man's voice from the bathroom was forceful, almost angry. I couldn't identify the words, but I knew it wasn't my father. And then there was the muffled, horrified screams of my mother. My mother, whose mouth had been covered with tape, and who I hadn't found until nearly seven hours after her death. You're gonna make me watch? I yelled, backing up toward the doorway. He was standing just beside the bathroom door. The dream catcher was now hanging from the doorknob. He held his hands behind his back and stared at me patiently as my mother struggled and screamed. No! I screamed again, and this time I turned and ran out the doorway, up the stairs, and into my room. I jumped on my bed and got under the covers like I was seven again, hiding from the boogeyman and waiting for the sun to come out and save me. Instead, my alarm was ringing. It was time to go to school. What a weird-ass dream, I thought. But I felt more well-rested than I had in weeks. The dream had been terrifying, but at least I'd slept through the whole night. I crept downstairs to get breakfast, careful not to let my dad hear me on the off chance he was awake. Sure enough, there he was, passed out on the couch with a dozen empty beer bottles surrounding him. Any spillage was just his drunkenness. There were pills scattered around, too. Those had worried me the first time I'd found him like this, but I'd learned quickly that they were to numb the pain, not to end it. My day went about as normal. Any excess energy the night's sleep had given me wore off by the time I got to school, and I walked around in my typical days. I didn't talk to anyone, kept my head down, did whatever I had to to avoid getting written up. When I got home, my dad was in his typical spot on the couch, drinking beer and watching TV. We didn't speak to each other, and I went up to my room to play video games. When it was time to go to bed, I couldn't sleep. I took my melatonin and counted backward from 100, but as usual, nothing worked. Except, I thought to myself, there is one thing that did work. It did put me to sleep, right? The only thing I knew for a fact was that it helped me sleep if only for a few hours, and I hadn't woken up screaming, shaking, or crying, just a little unsettled. And I was sure I'd just imagined all the scary bits, and whispers, visions, and dreams. I threw on my headphones, opened up the channel, and hit play on the video. There was the intro, the slides, and then the darkness. I took a deep breath and closed my eyes. I was in the kitchen. Within a few minutes, I was floating. Then the fall. Then the whisper, come, come with, with me. me. This time I turned the corner and looked into his fading yellow eyes. Why? I asked. Why do you want to make me watch? Not, Not watch, watch, he said. I'm, I'm here, here to, to bring, bring you peace. peace. He turned and walked to my parents' bedroom. 
I followed. Again upon entering the room, he hung the dream catcher on the bathroom doorknob, then stared at me until I approached the door. I heard the man barking his orders, then the muffled screams of my mom. This time I opened the door and ran inside. Mom! I yelled. She was on the floor with duct tape covering her mouth, and a tall man with broad shoulders and a long knife standing over her. I ran toward the man to tackle him and take the knife, but he was a grown man and I was only sixteen. He threw me to the side with one arm, then stepped toward me and slashed at me with the knife. I dodged backward and fell crashing against the wall. My mom took the moment's distraction to stand up and hit him from behind. Her attempt, however, more or less resembled a penguin attacking a polar bear. He turned, and with one swift motion, slit her throat. I let out torturous screams with no rhyme, reason, or pattern, and as if he'd forgotten about me, the man jumped and turned, then strode toward me. I woke up when the blade was about an inch away from my head. My sheets were drenched in sweat, and I breathed like I'd just run a marathon. In the back of my mind was the feeling I'd been close to death. Real death. I do not doubt that those events were real. What I'd gone through wasn't a dream, but an alternate reality. One in which I'd checked on my mother that night. That was what would have happened if I tried to save her. We'd both be dead. It's a dark and desolate realization, but it's the truth. It wasn't my fault that she died, no matter how many times I tried to tell myself that it was. After some time, I sat up. The first thing I noticed was the object sitting on my nightstand. It was the dream catcher, as beautiful as in my dream. Attached to it was a blue sticky note. I picked it up and turned it over. Not, Not a, new a new reality, reality but, a, but new a new memory. memory. Your, Your peace. peace. Use, Use this, this when, when you need it. it. Your, Your sleeping, sleeping friend. friend. It might not seem like what he gave me was a gift, the vision of my near death at the hands of an intruder, but what he did was answer all the questions I'd asked myself every single day since my mom died. What if I hadn't stayed in bed? What if I had tried to save her? Was it my fault that she died? It wasn't my fault, and I couldn't have saved her. It was no one's fault except for the man who walked into our house and killed her. Finally, the guilt began to fade away. Not all at once, but it was a start. I spent a few moments collecting my thoughts. Then I picked up the dream catcher and walked it down to the living room, where my dad lay passed out on the couch. I placed the dream catcher in his lap. I couldn't give him a new reality but I could give him a chance to make a new memory. I could, perhaps, bring him peace. Answers. Maybe I could even get him back. I hope you enjoyed 10 Hours of Black Noise to Bring You Peace as written by Connor Wright and voiced by Jeff Sturtevant. You can find more of author Connor Wright on their Reddit profile under the same name, C-O-N-N-O-R-W-R-I-T-E-S. All one word, folks. Jeff Sturtevant is quite involved with our network, where he does a little bit of everything from sound producing, writing, as well as sharing his vocal performances. You can also find him on Amazon and Audible by searching his name. It's spelled G-E-O-F-F-S-T-U-R-T-E-V-A-N-T. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us, please, on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, 
where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Consider this, folks. If you had to keep the car you're driving now for the rest of your life, would you really take good care of it? Wouldn't you change the oil a little more frequently? Tune it up from time to time? I bet you'd even splurge for the new air filter at Lubemeisters, wouldn't you? God knows it's somewhere between taupe and black at this point. You'd even wash and wax the thing, I bet. Shovel out the wrappers and empty water bottles. Hang a little pine tree from the rearview mirror. Hell, you'd even dig those old goldfish crumbs out from between the seat cushions. Anyway, look, I'm not here to bust your chops about your car. There's actually a point to this. The one thing you are stuck with for the rest of your life is your brain. There's no trading it in for an upgrade. You and your brain are ride or die. That said, you'd do well to give it a little TLC. And one of the best things you can do for the overall state of your mind is talk out your problems with a licensed professional counselor from our friends at BetterHelp. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that'll help you dig the crackers out of your cortical folks. Okay, lousy metaphor, but consider this. Stress, depression, anxiety, anger, whatever issues you're dealing with, these things will slow you down like sugar in your gas tank. And if therapy seems expensive, inconvenient, or uncomfortable to you, I've got some news. With our good friends at BetterHelp, it's never been cheaper or easier. Here's how it works. Within 48 hours of filling out a questionnaire, you'll be matched with a therapist perfect for you. You can text him anytime and schedule regular phone or video calls. It's all done remotely, so office visits are totally unnecessary. You get all the benefits of therapy and none of the hassle. Did I mention affordable? That's the icing on the cake. Traditional time-proven treatment at better help prices. I can't Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.